Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Perhaps one of the best known and most popular ideas coming from Freud's tripartite psychology distinguishing things into superego, ego, and id is exactly that. The id, this notion of there being this blind driving force within us that does things without us knowing it's largely unconscious and we have to be careful to somehow tame it. And, you know, there is a nice little passage in here where Freud says, to adopt a popular mode of speaking, we might say that the ego stands for reason and good sense, while the id stands for the untamed passions. And this is coming in lecture 31, the dissection of the psychical personality. So we're dissecting out that part in, in a way that's reminiscent for many people of Plato's tripartite psychology. In, in some respects, it's actually closer to other ancient psychologies than it would be to Plato's. But this notion that there's like the, you know, conscious, reasonable part of ourselves that doesn't have that much energy. And then we've got this other part of ourselves that has, you know, the energy, but no organization and is driven by its own appetites toward its own drivings towards and away from things. That's a very uh, common conception. It's not entirely correct. And Freud is, is uh, very keen to help us understand better the nature and the role of the id in his psychology in this lecture. So he begins by, you know, reiterating, this is not something absolutely new in Freud's work, but that we can call this the id or in German, the, the S and the id is a little bit more removed for us English speakers from what, what we would normally talk about. It really could be just translated as the it. The id is a Latinate form. You know, Freud is also using ego. Ego is I, right? So he tells us that it's a part of the personality alien to the ego. A little bit later, of course, he's also going to tell us that the ego develops from it, draws upon it for its sources of energy. So the relation is not so simple as, well, there's this part of ourselves we just simply don't understand. And there are I would say in his discussion here, four main characteristics that Freud is calling our attention to, to help us understand it. So the first is that he calls this a dark, inaccessible part of the personality. He says, um, what little we know of it, we've learned how from our study of the dream work. So, you know, the interpretation of dreams, a very thick work. He's also, when he talks about the dream work, he's talking about what he does with patients or clients, getting them to explain their dreams. And this would also have to do with, you know, related things like free association. He also then talks about symptoms and he tells us that uh, the construction of neurotic symptoms. So what, is, what does he mean there, the construction, the way that they are put together, the way that we can decipher them and unpack them in the dialogical or dialectical uh, relation between the therapist and the person who is being analyzed, right? The, the analysis the, in psychoanalysis. And then he tells us about analogies and this is quite important. Analogies are linguistic and cognitive. They're ways in which we make sense out of things that we can't fully express in their own terms. 
So, you know, Freud brings up, um, he says, we call it a chaos. Calling something a chaos is not a, strictly speaking, literal statement, right? It's an analogy. Uh, we don't really know what a chaos is like to begin with. Uh, maybe we've experienced some chaotic circumstances going into, uh, uh, you know, something that's been demolished and looking around, say, a bookstore that got bombed, and, and that could be a chaos. Um, but, you know, these are likenings, a cauldron full of seething excitations. Oh, a cauldron. <laughs> That's something I think most of us can quite so easily relate to. We can say a big cook pot, right, in which we're putting things and it's boiling over. So we understand the id through trying to make sense of it, but we're never getting at it directly. You can't bring it, so to speak, under the microscope. Uh, you can conceptualize it as a agency of the human being, a part of the personality, but what you're doing there is using images for something that's actually quite dynamic. Another key characteristic that he points out is that there's a lack of logical and temporal, even uh, spatial structuring going on. So he tells us it has no organization produces no collective will, only a striving to bring about satisfaction. The logical laws of thought do not apply to the id. Now, this is a kind of a big deal at the time that Freud is writing and speaking. The logical laws of thought. When we talk about logic today, a lot of people actually just turn it into a fetish, you know, the science, logic, reason crowd, right? And they don't actually know much about logic. There was a prevalent tendency at the time to consider logic as a discipline to encompass the laws of thought. If we can just get the laws of thought straight, then we can get rid of illogicalities and, and make our thinking more precise, better, more accurate. And so the id doesn't do that. The id is not concerned with those laws. You can propose those laws to the id and the id will probably just eat them or, you know, scratch itself on them or throw them out the window. Uh, you know, if you've ever watched, uh, as I've been recently rewatching the show, The Young Ones, um, some of the characters in there, particularly Vivian, would be a great example of you know the id <laughs> busting through through uh, the the walls and shouting and doing whatever it is that he chooses to do at the time, seemingly with no particular logic. And if you proposed you know laws of logic to to that, then it's not going to get any grasp. He also says this is true above all of the law of contradiction. So when we talk about the laws of thought. Uh, we often talk about, you know, law of excluded middle, law of contradiction. We can come up with a whole bunch of these in logic, and that's often what we teach in logic classes. Freud says that the id does not respect these. It's just not part of it. So he says, contrary impulses exist side by side without canceling each other out or diminishing each other. At most, they may converge to form compromises under the dominating economic pressure towards the discharge of energy, right? And he's not talking about economic in the sense of, you know, world economy or anything like that. He's talking about how things are coming together to produce certain results. He says there's nothing in the id that could be compared with negation. And we perceive with surprise an exception to the philosophical theorem that space and time are necessary forms of our mental acts. Again, a very popular way of, of looking at things that had bled into the intellectual culture. Uh, Kant, for example, had said that space and time are forms of perception. We're kind of stuck with them, right? And a lot of earlier philosophers had more or less taken them for granted. We can go on and think about contemporaries of Freud like Edmund Husserl, who are examining spatiality and temporality and how they appear to us and how they're constituted. You might take a look at Husserl's passive synthesis lectures. And Freud is saying, no, within the id, this doesn't actually hold. Um, how do we know this? He says, there's nothing in the id that corresponds to the idea of time. Okay, so the idea of time is not the same thing as time. That's a representation 
of time. But then he goes on and he says, there's no recognition of the passage of time. How is this evidenced if we can't actually look at the id directly? Well, the things that happened in the past that have remained somehow within the id are just as vivid today as they were 20 years ago when we were, you know, punished or lost an object or, you know, desired something and that desire was not fulfilled. He says, wishful impulses which have never passed beyond the id, but impressions too, which have sunk into the id by repression, are virtually immortal. After the passage of decades, they behave as though they had just occurred. So that's quite an important point uh, to, to make there. Freud is really stressing the lack of temporality much more than the uh, spatial disorganization. He'll talk about, you know, um, some of the things that he brings up in the dream work, condens condensation, displacement as being part of the the way in which the id, you know, frames things to itself, um, revealed, for example, through the dream work. Another key characteristic of the id is that it's governed by what Freud terms the pleasure principle. It doesn't define the pleasure principle in this lecture because it's a, you know, major concept within his works. Very simply put, and this is going to be a little bit of an oversimplification, the pleasure principle is that part of our, you know, our, you could call it makeup that drives us to pursue what is pleasant to us, you know, identify something as pleasant and then want more of it and more and more and more. And whatever is painful, it says, get that the hell away from me. I don't want any more of that. And so, it, you know, it's a very baseline hedonist principle, but as opposed to, we could say philosophies of hedonism, for example, Epicureanism. There is no valorization of this in the realm of morality or goodness, right? Instead, it's just you pursue it. You, you like the candy, eat the candy, eat some more candy. You put the uh, something bitter in your mouth and you know, taking a sip of your, your dad's beer when you're a little kid and don't appreciate bitter things. You know, you, you take a sip, you spit it out. You're like, oh, I don't want any more of that. And you see the beer can, you're like, get that away from me, right? That's uh, the sort of thing that Freud is talking about. And it goes all the way back to nursing and disliking being in a dirty diaper, whatever, whatever it's going to be. So he, he goes on and he says that um, the id knows no judgments of value, no good and evil, no morality. The economic, again, he uses that, that term, or if you prefer the quantitative factor, which is intimately linked to the pressure principle, dominates all of its processes. And here he also brings in a technical term. He says, instinctual cathexes seeking discharge. That is, in our view, all there is in the id. So what is a cathexis? Again, another Freudian term that he uses, it's something where we've you know, invested it, it with a certain kind of value, not the value that, that leads us to morality, but something that you could say is important for us, that we, we notice. And something can have you know, uh, a cathexis looking for, as he says, discharge. There's other possibilities as well, but these are deep down within our id. And so, you know, think about uh, when you first encounter sexuality and you realize that there's enjoyment to be had out of your own body. Well, there's cathexis there or the, the experience of eating something sweet or as later on you discover with intoxicants or pick any other thing that you want along those lines. Could be fun just to like listen to certain kind of, kind of music, right? Um, so the it is driven by these sorts of things. It's also driven by what has been repressed uh, into the id. And, and it's important to realize, so Freud brought this up a little bit earlier, right? But it's important to realize that when things are, you could say, pushed down into the id, as he's going to say later, there's one portion of the id from which the ego has separated itself by resistances due to repression. But the repression is not carried over into the id. The repressed merges into the remainder of the id. So the id is just like this massive 
space within us that has all this, this stuff and images and energies going on. That's another important characteristic. The id is the locus and the, you might say, orienter, at least at first, of all these instinctual energies that we have. And it supplies energy to the ego. And Freud talks a little bit about how the ego can trick the id into giving it more energy and how, you know, the, the id itself in some respects, you know, needs to be steered by the ego. If the id was allowed to just run its own show, it would kill the bearer of the id, the, the person, the human being, right? Uh, the ego does an important mediating function. It needs to rely on energies coming ultimately from the id in order to do that. I do want to bring up something that Freud talks about at the very end that in, in some respects represents where psychoanalysis is going. There's this famous phrase that gets made a lot of in interpretation of psychoanalysis. In the German, it runs, wo es war, so ich werden. And it's translated here, where it was, their ego shall be. Now, there's always a lot of controversies. Shall be, you know, for werden, because werden is also a word for becoming. And so there, maybe there's a little bit more intentionality here. But that's, that's framed as one of the key goals of psychoanalysis and he tells us that this is a work of culture or or development and that's one of the things that psychoanalysis you know recommends to us and recommends itself to us as a means of carrying out as human subjects all of whom have these ids but we don't want to be just driven by them. It's impossible to entirely eliminate the id, and that wouldn't be the goal. That would be actually a foolish counterproductive idea, but to replace significant portions of it by bringing things into consciousness and allowing us to then be you know, able to ha exercise some agency of our own towards them, that is a goal. So hopefully this gives you some conception of what Freud means by the id. It's a little bit more than the popular conception that often gets put forward of just this blind driving force that is, you know, destructive. It, it's actually, you know, there's a lot of features and sides to it, and it doesn't really have any organization in the sense that we're used to, but it, but it does have, you know, a, a number of different things going on within it.